Today's video is brought to you by Cars and Bids, my online enthusiast car auction site that recently sold this and this and this and this and this. This is a 1983 Lamborghini Countach. And in fact, it's my 1983 Lamborghini Countach. Yes, that's right. Sensible and reasonable Doug bought a crazy vintage Lamborghini. Today, I'm going to explain why. And I'm going to show you around my new car and show you some of its quirks and features. <laughs> All right, the Countach. And I'm going to start by asking the first question you are undoubtedly thinking, the biggest question, which is why? Why would Doug get a Countach? <laughs> Especially if you're a regular viewer to my channel, you probably know me as kind of reasonable and cautious and maybe even geeky. There were all those Doug is the type of guy memes about how nerdy I am. Doug is the type of guy who would put a band-aid on a bruise. <laughs> Doug is not the type of guy who would buy a Countach, and yet he did. So why? I'm going to start with actually a little confession. I bought my Carrera GT about a year ago, but I didn't start my search looking for a Carrera GT. I love the Carrera GT, my all-time dream car, my favorite thing. I've wanted one for years, but when I went out looking for a supercar, it was a Ferrari F40. The main reason was I realized that given my budget and given where F40 prices had been going, I I was pretty much about to miss my window for buying an F40. I was this close and I knew that F40 prices would just keep going like this and it was now or never. And as much as I love the Carrera GT, I kept thinking this is my one chance to get an F40. And so I went looking with the cultivated collector, Matthew Ivanhoe. He helped me try to find an F40 for the better part of six months and we just couldn't. My little window to buy one, it turned out I was just a little too late. Prices were already higher than I could afford, and I didn't end up with an F40. Changed my focus to the Carrera GT, bought that instead, and I love it. It's the greatest driving supercar of all time. It is my childhood icon. I'm thrilled to have that car. It is incredibly amazing, and it is just so tremendously special. But ever since I got the Carrera GT, there was always this little hole. There was always this little voice in my head that wanted some crazy looking 80 car with a big wing that everybody would stare at because nobody really looks at the Carrera GT. The F40 would have been that car, but I didn't get one. And I was always thinking I would still kind of like something that just turns everybody's head. That's just totally insane and exotic and ridiculous. The problem is that a lot of the really exotic cars, the real head turners, stop cars and coffee, holy crap, they're a whatever here, those cars have all become tremendously, unbelievably expensive. Ferrari F50s are five million bucks. Enzos are three and a half. Mercedes 300 SL Gullwings are all well over a million. Porsche 959 is a two million dollar car now. Everything has gotten crazy. Even Lamborghini Diablo SE30s are edging up on a million dollars. And so I spent a lot of time thinking, how do I scratch this itch? I have the greatest driving car, the Carrera GT. How do I get something that's head turning and insane and ridiculous and absurd, but still also not crazy money, a million dollars, seven figures. I don't want to go down that road again. What car combines those two things? And thus, the Countach. And there's more to the Countach too. Like everyone else, I had a poster of one of these on my bedroom wall as a kid growing up. I think it really is the ultimate supercar in the sense that it just prioritizes insanity above all else. Any form of practicality was cast aside to make this the most ridiculous, crazy, absurd looking, sounding, driving, feeling car 
it is the ultimate supercar. And to me, it's kind of crazy that you can buy the ultimate supercar for five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars, considering what everything else costs. F40s are three million dollars. Carrera GTs are one and a half. The Lamborghini Miura is two million. This car seems actually a pretty good bargain, considering just how iconic it really is. And if I'm honest, another reason that I gravitated towards the Countach is because I think this car's pricing is going to increase. I think these are only going to get more valuable in the future. Uh, a little story. Five years ago, I bought my Ford GT for $225,000. And the same like week or month, Matt Farah bought his Countach for $260,000. Now, I remember thinking I would love a Countach, but I just can't stretch anymore. It is just too expensive. That extra thirty-five grand can not do it. Well, five years later, my Ford GT is worth maybe $325,000, and Matt Farah's Countach has easily doubled in value. The market is really starting to appreciate these cars, and I think the only place they're going is up. 13 years ago, when I was graduating from college, a Mura, Lamborghini Mura, was a six dollars to $700,000 car. And I remember on the forums, someone had a really pristine one, a special version or low miles, and they asked a million dollars for it and people openly mocked this person. I remember reading it open like you'll never get a million dollars for a Mura. That's insane. Well, these days Muras sell for a million five minimum. Nice ones can hit two and a half to three million. And in my mind, I just don't see how that doesn't happen to the Countach. This car is such an icon. There's becoming more interest, more excitement, and that's going to lead to higher values in the future. It just has to. This car is just so special. And you can already see evidence of this increasing interest in the Countach. If you just take a look at my YouTuber colleagues, Harry Metcalf, who runs the YouTube channel Harry's Garage, my favorite YouTube channel, including my own, <laughs> he's had a Countach for years, but some others have started to pursue them. The Stradman recently bought a Countach, also white. Hoovy of Hoovy's Garage recently bought a Countach, and of course, Matt Farah has now had his Countach for a few years. And these guys don't seem to be doing it for views. Most of them aren't really making all that much content about their Countaches. Instead, I suspect they're doing it because they're reaching a similar conclusion, which is a brand new McLaren might be fast, but you get in that and it has an automatic transmission and a backup camera, and it just doesn't give you the same old school analog hardcore thrill that this car does. Sure, the McLaren is faster, but you get in there and there's a touch screen and perfect air conditioning. And I think we've all come to the same conclusion. This is an experience that simply cannot be matched. This is the ultimate supercar. And of course, I think these car YouTubers that I just mentioned have reached a level of wealth you know, before most other people in our millennial generation, YouTube certainly helped with that. And so they've gone out and bought these cars. But I have a suspicion that as the years roll on and as millennials make more money, start businesses, get more success, they're going to want to buy cars just like this that provide this specific experience. And the Countach is kind of the king of that. And as a result, I just can't imagine these will sit forever at their current price point. Now, I know what you're thinking, which is, sure, prices on Countaches may rise, but aren't these tremendously temperamental? Isn't it going to be difficult and expensive to own this car? Aren't these known for having all sorts of problems and costing all sorts of money just to keep running? And my response is, let's find out. Yes, these cars have a reputation for being temperamental and difficult, but a lot of that reputation was born out of the late 90s and early 2000s when the internet was just getting started, people were just starting to talk about them, and when you could buy a Countach for $70,000. And yes, that is a real figure. In that time period, it was easy to find a Countach for $50,000, $70,000, absolutely no problem. And at that point, when you've spent 
spent that amount of money on a car like this, a $30,000 major service bill can be an enormous amount of money. It's half the value of the car. And so a lot of people talked about how incredibly expensive these were to own by the standards of the time. But the thing is, now that the Countach is routinely selling for $500,000, dollars $700,000, a different type of person is buying these cars. And the people who are buying Countaches now are ready for those maintenance costs, both financially and mentally. A lot of the people who are buying these cars have multiple homes and boats and huge car collections, and they know what they're getting into with a vintage exotic car. They're not stretching to spend every last dollar for a 70 grand car that needs a $30,000 service. I think the servicing and repair costs on this won't be particularly surprising to the people who are buying them now. Plus, one other important thing to mention, I know a few people who have Countaches, well-sorted Countaches, and they tell me it's really not all that bad. Once you get the car dialed in, it seems to be a relatively drivable, ownable, easy enough experience. Once you get the car dialed in, which isn't always easy or cheap, but when you get to that point, people who I know with these cars say pretty positive things about the ownership experience. And again, the people buying them now are more willing to spend the right money on the right things to get these Countaches correctly dialed in, which wasn't always the case 20 years ago. That's not to say that I think this is going to be easy. <laughs> I bought this car from someone who has a huge car collection, and this was his only vintage car. He had bought it because, like me, he had a poster of it on his wall as a kid, and he wanted to try it out. And he sold it because, he wouldn't admit this, but it is true, he sold it because it just wasn't as easy as all of the other modern supercars in his collection. A Pagani, a McLaren, you just jump right in, they're automatics, door's pretty easy, climbing in is simple, you push a button to get it in gear, a backup camera pops up on the touchscreen, the climate control works, and if it has a problem, then poof, you send it off back to the dealership for easy servicing, they'll take care of it. You will notice that the Hamilton collection, kind of famous, social media collection of a lot of exotic cars, they just sold their Lamborghini Countach after spending an enormous amount of money to dial it in and get it just right, and then they sold it. And that was the same sort of thing. Some people who have a lot of money, I don't wanna say that they're not car enthusiasts, but in today's world, driving and owning a supercar can be easy with a lot of the modern cars. This requires work, it requires patience, it requires effort, and not everybody wants to put in that effort. Unless you're a real enthusiast, really committed and dedicated, you might think to yourself, why put up? with everything that the Countach is. When I could just jump in my McLaren Senna and put on Bluetooth and press the axle lift and drive off nice and easy. To me, I look at this car and I think that's what makes it special. Okay, a Porsche 918 is a car that anybody can go buy if they're rich. It doesn't take any special effort to own. You don't have to learn how to drive it or fit inside of it or put up with any challenges, fit it into your garage, any of that stuff. It's a hybrid and an automatic and it takes the supercar experience and it makes it easy. It's like a sanitized supercar for people who are rich who want to buy something that people who are rich buy but it takes a real dedicated, committed enthusiast to instead pursue a Countach. The Countach is the car enthusiast supercar. It may not start, it may break down, it may smell like fuel, it's hard to see, it's hard to fit inside, but I think that's all part of the fun of this car. And I think that experience is going away in so, so, so many 
modern vehicles. The next crop of supercars will all be fully electric and they will all do zero to 60 in one point something seconds. And I have a feeling that speed is no longer going to be interesting or rarefied as these cars come out. Hell, the Kia EV6 does zero to 60 faster than my Porsche Carrera GT. Speed has been democratized. It's available to everyone for not that much money. But what is getting harder to find is the old school, hardcore feel, the experience of a car like this. When speed is available in a Kia crossover, it doesn't matter anymore. And then you start looking for other experiences that are rarefied, that are hard to come by, like this one. So with all that out of the way, the explanation of why I chose the Countach, let's talk about my car. First off, the color, white with white wheels. It's just right, it's correct. I always buy my cars in the poster color, the color from the press advertisements. And for the Countach in the 80s, that was this, white, white. Why though, this specific version of the Countach? There are several versions that was made for like 15 years. So here's the deal. The early Countach models were called the Periscopio, and those are tremendously celebrated and desired. I think they're beautiful. They're like free of adornments, simple design, really cool, but they're really small, hard to fit inside. Lamborghini only made about 150 of them total, and they all cost over a million bucks. So that one wasn't for me. I also didn't want a 25th anniversary model. That was the Countach that came at the end of production. And by then they had tacked on all these vents and strikes and lines to help make the car look faster and cooler and frankly more modern than it was because the design had been around forever by then. The anniversary cars just don't look that great compared to the earlier models, at least in my opinion and in the market's opinion, because they're the least desirable, least expensive Countach. Still cool cars, but it wasn't what I wanted. So I didn't want an early one, didn't want a late one. I wanted a Countach that was right in the middle. And I also wanted a carbureted car. Countaches were all carbureted initially, but then they came out with fuel injection largely to get the car certified for emissions to sell here in the United States. Fuel injected cars are fine, but to me the Countach is a carbureted car. That's how it was designed, but it's also how it smells, how it sounds. That's like the Countach. That's part of this car, carburation. <laughs> Even though some say that makes it less reliable, to me that was also part of what made the Countach the Countach, the feel, the smell, the sound, it comes from that carbureted V12. And so, after looking around for a long while, I bought exactly that. Countach from the middle of production, white with white wheels, and with the carbureted V12. Checked all my boxes, and let me show you a couple of interesting details. I'll start with the wing. Everybody knows the Countach has a wing. It's part of this car's look, part of its story. It has this massive rear wing. The Countach, by everybody's thinking, is a winged car, except that it isn't. Here's something that will blow your mind. No Countach left the factory with a wing. When Lamborghini was creating the Countach, <laughs> they couldn't get the wing to pass regulations. For obvious reasons, it blocks all rear visibility. And so the cars rolled off the factory floor in order to pass regulations with no wing. And then some of the cars were immediately modified by Lamborghini, reportedly in a parking lot next door to the factory to add a wing. And the result of that is that this wing is factory or maybe it isn't factory. There's no record of which cars got wings from the factory because technically none of them did. Dealers added wings, dealers took off wings. <laughs> it was a free for all really. And to this day, Countach owners are still adding and removing wings to suit their taste. And here's another great Countach story from those days. You can see my car is called a 5000S. 
S. But this model was not originally called the 5000S. Instead, it was called the 500, which came after the earlier version, the 400, the LP400. So why did they change it from 500 to 5000? Because 5000 sounded better. 5000 was more. Why call it the 500 when we could call it the 5000? I am not making this up. There were only a few hundred 5000S models made. Some of them were the 500S, some of them were the 5000S, but regardless, that's the reason for the <laughs> bizarre name change. It just sounded cooler. The other thing that was really important to me for this Countach, I wanted a round belly. <laughs> so the Countach first came out. It was kind of free of like wheel arches and wings. It was pretty simple. And over the years, they added stuff to the design to make it well, less simple. In the late 80s, they put these strakes on the side of the car that I personally really, really do not like. I think it kind of screws up the whole look of the Countach, and cars without those strakes are called round belly cars. So not only did I want a carbureted car from the middle of Countach production, ideally white, white, but I was also looking for a round belly instead of the side strake. So there were only a few hundred cars that really matched what I wanted. It was a needle in a haystack, but I got lucky and I found this one. I also got lucky because this car has been driven. It has almost 60,000 kilometers, like 35,000 miles, a lot. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to buy a car that I could drive and use guilt-free without having to think about, is this mile worth the value depreciation? I wanted something I could use, and this car is that because it's already been used. In fact, this car was used by one single owner from when it was sold new in California in the early 80s all the way until 2020. One owner had this car in Virginia and he kept this massive stack of records that shows all the work that's been done to this car over the years. And that's pretty much exactly how you want to buy one of these cars. Now, the drawback is that the owner of this car obviously aged with the car and by the end he was pretty sick. He wasn't really using the car all that much. He died, the car was sold in 2020 and and since then, it's mostly been sitting for the last three years. And so it really hasn't been driven much in the last probably five, six, seven years, which isn't really a great formula for buying a car and wanting to start using it. And I suspect I will have a lot of expensive servicing, repairs, maintenance to do and to catch up on in order to actually use this car with the frequency that I want to. Now, inevitably, that means this car is going to spend some time in the coming months at repair shops and people are going to post on social media, ha ha, I told you it was going to break. You're so stupid for thinking it wasn't. But I just want to point out, I know this car is going to need some servicing in my first year or two of ownership with it. Quite a lot, actually. And I factored that into the purchase price. It made sense to buy this car where it is. Hopefully I can drive it for a few months, kind of figure out what's going on with it, and then send it off for a, a lot of work to be done. So I'm expecting that completely. And I think that's par for the course for a car that's been sitting for a while. But the good news is we're not quite there yet, meaning I can take this car out and have a little bit of fun with it for at least a little while first. So let's do it. Let's go drive my new Countach. <laughs> this is so cool. All right, driving my own Lamborghini Countach. This is just so cool. It's a dream come true. On the road, it feels great. Like this car just feels fantastic. It is so cool. Now, as you can see, the headliner is kind of falling down. There's a list I'm making of, of you know, some stuff that this car is gonna need uh, in order to kind of be the level where I need it to be. But right now there's, you know, there's not all that much. The car was gone through pretty well by a previous owner. It was years ago, but pretty well. Um, and so I'm just cruising in it. This is so cool! <laughs> Man, I am astonished by how much I like this experience. I, you know, I'm not like, this isn't who I am. Like I like the Ford GT. I've always said, I buy your supercars from a company that makes normal cars because they have to do them right. Like Ford GT, they test it like a Ford. And Porsche Carrera GT, they test it like a Porsche. This car obviously is the exact opposite. There's no testing. They just throw you to the wolves. But 
I don't know, there's something cool about it. I can't believe I'm driving a Countach. <laughs> this is so cool. I can't see anything, it's lovely. The thing about this car, it's like I was saying before, like a 918 is an amazing machine, it really is. It's so special, it's so great. But like, there's just something about this old visceral feel that you just don't get. You just can't get in any form of modern car. The sound of that V12, it's furious, it's angry, it's so cool. The driving experience, the feel of this car, it's just so analog and you know what you're looking like when you drive it along, which is insane on a totally crazy level. It is just one of the coolest damn things in the world. It really is. People freak out. It's a woman in a Volkswagen Kiguan. She's not who I would expect to be the freak out person, but you freak out when you see this car. You just do. Oh man, this is so cool. This is probably the most excited I've been about a car that I own maybe ever. It drives well too. I'm now going, I mean, I gotta be going 75 miles an hour here. No problem. Uh, it's stable, it's solid. I mean, this car's had some really good work done to it, so I'm hoping I can get away with not doing much, or not doing much for a while at least. Oh, I am like obsessed with this car. Everything you do in this car feels cool. The way it sounds, the way it looks. I mean, there's no such thing as like not being cool driving this car. Until it comes time to get out of it, then everybody looks like an idiot. You might now hear there's a fan behind me that's kind of noisy. That's another issue that's on my little issues list to take care of. Oh, this is so neat. It also doesn't drive badly. I mean, that's, I think, the real key to the Countach story. Everybody's like, oh, it's amazing looking, but it's like this trash car to drive. It's not true at all. Like the feel, the sound, it's not incredibly fast by modern standards, but I've got cars for that, as do all Countach owners at this point. You can get a Corvette, a C8 Corvette, if you want to be fast. Like this is everything. The way it feels, the way it looks, the way it drives, the sound. Ah, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. Oh, and the gated shifter. Hear that click, click. And to be shifting gears in your own V12. How cool is this thing? And it's amazing. I can't believe it's mine. Like, I wanted Career GT forever and ever and ever, and that is an amazing car, and I love having it. But this, there's just something about doing the, the crazy thing. Like, this is the crazy thing. And by the way, I forgot to mention this video, but it's worth pointing out, I had the opportunity to buy a Storado. They're not incredibly easy to come by. The dealer offered me an allocation, and I said, I love the Storado, I love it, I want to be your customer, I'm going after a Countach. And driving this thing here today, boy, am I glad that I did. Listen to that. Storato ain't sounded like that. I'm just like astonished by how cool this is. Again, definitely not me. Definitely like the dangerous thing, but I love it. This is one of, this is the coolest car I've ever owned. And it might just be, everybody's, everybody freaks out. It might just be the coolest car you can own. <laughs> and so that's my Lamborghini Countach. <laughs> this car is certainly a departure for me. The oldest car I've ever owned, the least like me, but it gives me everything. The best driving supercar, the Carrera GT, the easiest and most usable supercar, the Ford GT, and now the craziest <laughs> supercar, the Countach. It's a great group, and with cars like that, who really needs an F40?